Hi there. My name is Casey Shipman, and I am the program coordinator for Instant Israel at CJE Senior Life. And today begins our Shakespeare 101 series. And if you're a little nervous because Shakespeare might seem a little too daunting, don't worry. We're going to take it really slow, really simple, but it's going to be fun. So I want to give you a little background on William Shakespeare, although he is a little bit of a mysterious character. We don't know exactly when he was born. We have a rough idea of, we know the year and a rough idea of about what time of year. Um, spring of 1564 is as close as historians have been able to get. He was born in Stratford-upon-Avon, England, which is uh, in Warwickshire County. It's about 90 miles northwest of London. So not that far from, you know, really big city that became a big part of his life and definitely his career. Um, there's no record of any education past grammar school, but we do know that at his grammar school, he learned Latin, uh, writing, arithmetic, some Christianity, um, and uh, classical writers and text analysis. And we think that that's kind of what sparked his passion for writing and theater. The Bard. So Shakespeare <laughs> married at the age of 18 to um, a woman, Anne Hathaway, who was eight years older than him. Together they had three kids. They had a daughter, Susanna, and they had twins, Hamnet and Judith. And sadly, when the twins were about 11, uh, Hamnet, the only boy, passed away. The lost years, so from 1585 to 1592, we don't really know much of what happened in Shakespeare's life. So shortly after his son died, there was some time of absence from him. Um, like I said, he's, he was a mysterious guy, so who knows what he was doing, you know, soul searching in that time, dealing with the loss. Um, there's a lot of legends and conjecture about what he may have been up to in that time, but nobody really knows for sure. What we do know is in 1592, he appeared in London and quickly became a really popular dramatist. The Bard. So what does that name mean? The word bard means poet. So Shakespeare is called the bard because he's widely recognized as the greatest poet known to mankind. He um, was known for not only being a playwright, but also an actor and part owner of London's leading theater companies. He was part owner of the theater company, The King's Men, which thrived and was a really big successful theater until the Commonwealth closed the theater in 1642. The first folio. So plays in during the Renaissance were not considered very high class uh, literature. Um, they were seen as kind of for for commoners like comic strips or something like that. You know, they weren't really classic literature like a novel or something like that. So plays tended to be printed as uh, what was called a quarto, kind of equal to maybe like a paperback book, a really simple, cheap way to, to print the text. Uh, folios were actually traditionally reserved for religious and classical works. Seven years after his death, however, after Shakespeare's death, two of his colleagues compiled all of the works they could find of his and had them published. And this was partly, you know, to um, continue on his writing and his success, but also they obviously made a big profit off of doing that. So in 1623, the first folio containing 36 of Shakespeare's plays was published. Um, it was compiled from stage prompt books, um, the playwright's own handwritten notes and manuscript, and versions of the plays that had already been published. So it was kind of a big compilation of, you know, piecing together all of the works they could find. In 
it took two and a half years to print and there's a little picture of a printer but obviously they didn't have that back then they were writing it all by hand which is why each copy was a little different because there were different people writing it so they might have interpreted something differently or made a mistake on one and didn't want to rewrite the whole the whole thing so they just left it in there's actually um, so only 230 copies are left in the world, and one of those copies is in Chicago's Newberry Library collection of rare books. So if you're ever in the Newberry Library, definitely go and, and see, um, you know, actual, an actual piece of Shakespeare's work, an original piece. Um, Shakespeare's company only had a few days to rehearse an entire play. So there were lots of built-in cues throughout the script so that everyone, the cast and crew, could see what was happening with the action. Um, so they could all be on the same page. So, you know, stage notes like a bird comes flying into the scene, you know, so that this, the crew knows, okay, we need to build a bird. It needs to come on at this point. So they all had the same piece of work to go off of because they needed to know. They didn't have the time to sit down and discuss things. And the other uh, piece of that is that it means 400 some odd years later, actors can still use the work because they can use textual clues and, and the, the notes and the scripts to, to figure out what's happening, what you know the underlying action is and things like that. So what was happening um, around England when Shakespeare was, was doing his work? Elizabeth I was uh, the queen at the time. She ruled for um, about 60 years. She had a really, really big influence on, um, on culture, fashion, uh, a lot of aspects of England society. There were very few monarchs um, that carried on such a um, such a big changes to society even after she left, including you know clothing and culture, different things like that. Uh, Queen Elizabeth the first was well known for um, for thwarting male admirers and for being um, for uh, not being married. She never got married. Um, and in choosing to do so, she avoided um, allying herself and the throne with another country and making those kinds of um, political deals that um, marriages tended to be uh, with, between royalty at the time. So England could remain independent and you know, not owe anybody anything. Um, the monarchy at this time was seen as kind of God's hand on earth. So when you were, it was interpreted that when you were rebelling against the monarchy or, or the king or queen or whomever was in charge, you were really rebelling against God. So it was a really, really big deal if you went against the crown. Um, Henry VIII divorced his wife um, at the time to marry Anne Boleyn, who was uh, Elizabeth I's mother. He divorced her eventually, and because divorce was against the law um, in Catholicism, Elizabeth, their daughter, was seen as illegitimate to the throne because she was from a divorced marriage. She also inherited the throne in the wake of the really big uh, Protestant Reformation, which led to a lot of um, changes in society and politics, but also in the theater, as we'll see later. So this is King James. He was a cousin of, um, of the Queens who took over after she passed, as she didn't have any um, heirs to the throne, obviously. Um, around this time, a lot of changes were happening um, in society, in uh, British society, as far as classes, um, 
the economy. So it was England's economy was largely based in agriculture and um, farmers would be really, really poor while the landowners would be making all the profits. So there developed a lot of uprising and food riots and things like that in rural areas. Um, like areas where Shakespeare would have grown up. He would have seen a lot of the turmoil between the two classes. Um, London at the time was really seen as a really polarizing city because it brought together um, really wealthy people and really, really poor people living in the same, um, side by side in the same city. And around this time too, the economy started transitioning from agriculture to trade and manufactured goods. So there was a rising middle class developing who aspired to the aristocracy. Queen Elizabeth died in uh, 1603 and her cousin <clears throat> uh, James took over. He was the King of Scotland at the time. He became uh, King James the first. You might recognize King James from uh, the translation to the English Bible. So the King James Version is a really, really popular common uh, translation of the Bible. It was developed in 1611. So touring, um, going on the road was, has been going on in theater since the dawn of theater. Um, you know, there are big productions now, you see a Phantom of the Opera, you know, with giant chandeliers and, and boats and all kinds of things now, but, um, back then, you know, there were even, um, you know, wandering jugglers and mimes and, you know, a one-man show who would kind of go from town to town with, you know, the clothes on his back performing. Um, but the one thing that, you know, no matter the size of the show or what kind of show it is, that theater always needs is an audience. So if the audience can't come to the theater, the theater will go to them. And as early as the second century BC, companies, theater companies traveled the Roman Empire, setting up stages at carnivals and market squares just to reach the people. And as the Catholic Church became powerful, um, plays were forbidden, especially Greek and Roman plays, which you know were kind of the start of theater, um, because the Catholic Church felt they were promoting pagan beliefs. And at the time, actors were seen as outcasts from society, to the point where you know, so a lot of actors found other work. To the point where really the only performers, street performers around were, you know, minstrels and jugglers and things like that. The actors, <clears throat> the actors had to find, um, you know, new means of life. So as a boy, most likely Shakespeare would have seen traveling shows uh, come to his hometown or nearby. Um, obviously, the plague was big at the time, which would have closed theaters. Um, in London and all over the country for weeks to months at a time. And during this, so, so because of that, a lot of companies took to the road again to, to continue performing. So this here is a picture of a traveling circus. It's um, not a theater, but you know, you can see all kinds of characters, um, the different, you know, the wagon in the back, what they would be uh, bringing things in on. Um, they really had to carry everything, you know, they could only bring what they could carry. So everything was on, you know, a cart or a few, a couple of carts, you know. Um, so theater, so the Catholic Church had established, had <clears throat> essentially killed theater in England. Um, but after some time, the, the church, um, started to develop their own plays, um, the mystery play or the medieval miracle. So these were stories that were based on Bible stories. So Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah's Ark, um, the nativity, the passion play. Um, and the, these mystery plays reinforced the church's teachings. The stages uh, 
um, would they would go from you know village to village basically sharing the bible sharing stories and a lot of times they would set up these mystery plays in kind of uh, several in a row, you know, so maybe six different mystery plays. And then townspeople would take a day to go watch each show and kind of cycle through the Bible, the Bible stories. There were characters um, like despair or divine correction. I mean, it was very literal uh, work. And these morality plays, um, made way for new theatrical forms. So small companies of actors wandered through Europe um, performing for anyone who would pay. So they, so the, the Catholic Church, even though they had kind of uh, squashed theater, actually revitalized it and, and um, inspired actors to get back out there and start performing again. So they would use um, flatbed carts for transportation. That's you know, like I said in this picture, you would keep everything on there. That was that was your stage. That was how you got from town to town. That was also your storage. Um, some sets were uh, used horse-drawn wagons, uh, and um, some wagons carried structures of two or more stories. Actually, I mean, they got really, really elaborate with their productions on these carts. So sometimes it would be, you know, one horse pulling a cart. Sometimes you'd need four horses to get these big, you know, these big acts together. With the theater's resurgence in the Renaissance, um, theater became a vital part of culture. Um, and so the Puritans got, uh, got a little scared once it started becoming big again, and they shut it down for another 18 years. <laughs> So theater has been, you know, trying to make its claim for a long time in Europe and England. Um, so in the meantime, when they were doing these traveling shows, directors and designers experimented with different, um, different things on the stage. So sometimes they would have real animals in pastoral plays, or they would be pouring buckets of water on the stage to make it look like it was raining. Um, all kinds of really literal experiments on the stage. <clears throat> um, so King James actually passed legislation to remove religion from English playhouses. Uh, so there's this back and forth between the church and the monarchy of, you know, who can say what in the theater. So it's, it's a lot of back and forth between, you know, what you can say and what you can't say and, and who's calling the shots. So the problem was as the stories became more secular, then officials were worried that they were becoming too immoral. So you just can't please everybody in the theater. Um, theaters outside London were frequently shut down due to plague and political riot, rioting for this exact reason. When plays were open, they had to run everything by the master of revels. So this, most likely a man, this guy uh, would read, would have to read and approve every word of the play, kind of go through, comb over it, and, you know, make sure it was all appropriate. Um, obviously, this was not possible. Um, so theaters would find ways around it, whether, you know, they were um, you know, bribing them or, or, you know, just ignoring it, whatever it was, they weren't following the rules. At the time um, of Queen Elizabeth and, and on, beyond that, um, actors were considered basically criminals, um, low-class criminals, unless they could secure patronage from um, noblemen or the monarchy. So unless they were performing for royalty or really big important people, they were vagabonds, they were nobodies. Um, the stigma of sin that the church placed on secular entertainment lasted into Shakespeare's day. So even through Shakespeare's day, um, he would have been considered a vagabond. Um, which means they didn't have any rights. Shakespeare and his company were 
were fortunate that they did get into um, the Queen's Court and uh, were able to perform and be successful. Um, so they weren't just seen as like street urchins, but a lot of actors were. The Globe Theater. So Shakespeare's troupe entertained at the Queen's Court um, and continued once King James took the throne. Their success, um, their payment, basically. So the Globe Theater. Shakespeare's troupe um, entertained for the Queen at her court and they continued performing for King James. And through the success, the funds that they made um, performing for the royalty, they were able to, to fund the construction of the Globe Playhouse in 1599. Um, and the Globe joined um, a few other theaters that were able to be successful just outside of London's uh, city jurisdiction. So um, a full house in the theater could seat about 3,000 people. Not necessarily seat, a lot of them were standing. Um, it could fit about 3,000 people. So it was a, it was a big space. Um, or they were just really cramming people in, probably, probably a little both. And what was interesting about theater back in this time is that they would make a whole day of going to the show. So the audience would arrive hours and hours, you know, most of the time now you arrive, you know, 30, 20 minutes before the show. Back in Shakespeare's time, they were showing up hours before the show because there's a chance to meet with friends, to drink, um, eat. They actually, you know, sold refreshments at um, the shows at this time. So it was really almost kind of more like a tailgating experience. You know, you show up a few hours early, hang out, and then you watch the game. Um, it was a really, really social and communal event that took up a lot of the day. So this was a, you know, they didn't have TV or anything like that. This was the social event, you know, of, of the month or the week or the year or whatever it was. Um, affluent patrons paid two pence or more for a gallery seat. Those seats you see up um, along the, the rows and uh, peasants stood in front of the stage down here on the floor for a penny, which at the time was about a day's wage for a skilled worker. Um, the audiences obviously were very diverse. Um, you know, the queen was seeing it, but also, you know, the, the you know, random people, you know, on the streets were also, would be at the same theater with her, you know, seeing the same show. So Shakespeare really worked to represent all these different kinds of people coming together and, and their different stories and was able to appeal to every cross section of society at the same time, which was really impressive. Um, so what else is interesting is how the theater has changed in that um, you know, now today, front row seats, that's like, you know, prime real estate, people want to be in the front row. But back then, the front row was, you know, those are the cheap seats, you had to stand, you know, you were, probably weren't getting a great view, you're seeing the actor's feet, you know, or whatever it is, you're not seeing all of the action. So it's definitely changed in that sense. Most plays had pretty short runs, um, and were seldom revived, you know, they were just churning out a, you know, writing a play, turning it out really quickly, taking a couple days to put it together, putting it on, and then, you know, then it was dead, then it was on to the next project. Mainly because, you know, theater was, theater was the social, you know, was kind of the whole social world at the time. So basically everyone had seen it, you know, um, everyone went to the plays. So if they saw it, you know, they didn't want to see it again, they wanted to see something new. So companies were always rehearsing new shows and they only had a couple days to get it together. Um, but of course, without electricity, um, plays could only be performed during the day. So uh, the other thing is that sets and props were really bare and basic because they didn't have the time or budget to put together, you know, these crazy big elaborate um, scenes. So it was really about the language and about the action and not so much about, you know, these crazy sceneries that we're seeing now in shows. Um, 
another so this last bullet uh no scene breaks so when you go see a show in between scenes you know usually there's a blackout or maybe they pull the curtains or something like that and you know that they're transitioning to a new location a because it was daytime they didn't have darkness you know there's no electricity so they couldn't turn the lights out and they didn't have a lot of scenery so they didn't have curtains or anything like that that they could close so scenes just changed before your eyes so if you know uh here, an example stage directions in Macbeth a banquet is appeared a banquet is prepared so most likely while the scene before it was taking place crew behind them was putting the the banquet together in front of the whole audience so it's a really different uh kind of theater you know you wouldn't you wouldn't expect to see that nowadays probably be really thrown off by it actually um, from what scholars reconstruct, Shakespeare's plays were performed mostly in contemporary dress. So they weren't changing into costumes. They were probably wearing, you know, what they wore from home to the theater. Um, it didn't matter what the settings were. You know, they really kept the show's bare bones just down to, you know, the words and the interactions with, with the actors. However, if company members um, had tailoring skills or things like that, they would be making you know, whatever costumes they could. And also the English aristocracy showed their support by donating old clothes that they could use, uh, that the, the companies could use for costumes. Because women were not permitted on the stage until 1660, up until then, female roles were played by young boys who typically had, you know, more slender figures and higher voices than, you know, a, a grown man. So they were usually in the role of a female with a wig or a dress on or something like that. Um, theaters, so theaters were closed for a while. They reopened um, after the English monarchy was restored with Charles II in 1660. So that around that same time um, that women could take to the stage. The Globe was open for a while, and then the Great Fire of London destroyed it uh, just six years later. Um, between the fire and the eight years of, of Commonwealth rule, where they, um, uh, where they couldn't perform, they lost a lot, of, um, a lot of Shakespeare's content, a lot of his manuscripts and things like that were lost um, between those times when the, the theater couldn't run and then was destroyed. 100 years, often called the golden age of the English theater, um, Puritans and power of the government succeeded in 1642 in closing the theaters again. So there were now 100 years where uh, theater wasn't happening or couldn't happen. So this is another uh, look at the globe looking at it head on um, so you can see where the tourists are standing that's where um, you know the the penny seats were if you will um, it was wasn't unusual for Shakespeare's plays to be uh, cut rewritten or rearranged um, to suit the audience so you know the script was a living thing it wasn't just set in stone you know they changed it as they needed to um, Romeo and Juliet, for example, was rewritten uh, at least four different times. In some versions, uh, the lovers didn't die. Spoiler alert if you haven't <laughs> heard of Romeo and Juliet. Um, in some versions, the lovers didn't die. In other versions, there are really big, elaborate funeral processions at the end. So it was just kind of what appealed to their, what they, what they thought the audience wanted and what appealed to them. Um, the interior of the Globe Playhouse, which you can see here, opened in 1599. Um, a raised platform surrounded uh, from the stage, surrounded by an open circular era, area with seating on three levels. Um, this is a, a thrust th a stage, so um, it's not all flat in front of you. Like a lot of stages um, you can picture, it's uh, it's actually pushed out into the audience so that you're you know the, the audience can be on the sides of it and you're more immersed into the action. The play unfolds between the audience members seated along the sides and the actors. Um, what makes this so 
uh, what makes a thrust so exciting to be an audience member is that you really feel like you're in the action and you're a part of it and the the actors are closer to you and they can hear your your gasps or your laughter um and things like that as they perform so it's really a give and take um you know the closer the audience can get to the actors what's in a genre so plays are are written to be performed live they're there's a reason that that you know movie and play scripts are so different because um, you know in a film your audience is the camera they're not you're not going to hear a, a camera gasp or you know smile you know smile at something um, the, the theater in the theater you need that energy and that emotion from your audience drama is such a historic uh, means of communication, you know, as I mentioned before, they were performing, you know, in Greek and Roman times because um, it's such a, a powerful outlet to tell stories or to give lessons, to teach about history, religion, whatever it is. Um, people really gravitate towards drama and theater to, to learn those lessons. Uh, cave paintings of men disguised as animals uh, were discovered actually from thousands of years ago um, in Egypt and Mesopotamia. So it goes to show you that, you know, people have been imitating other people or animals or telling stories as long as we've been alive. That because that two-way communication is really important in performing um, and in telling stories. And in, in theater, the two-way communication is um, not unlike uh, comedians. You know, if you've ever been to a stand-up show or you've, or, you know, you've seen it on TV, things like that, the comedian really thrives off of the audience. You know, they can tell when a joke's gone too far and people didn't like it or when, you know, this joke's too hilarious, you know, I need to wait a couple more minutes to let them, you know, laugh it out. Like I said, it's a, it's a living thing and, and uh, the audience is as much a part of the show as the actors are and they really need that interaction. Shakespeare didn't publish his plays. As I mentioned, his friends published them after his death. Um, so to that end, we don't know how many, you know, he would have said he wrote or you know how he would have categorized them or anything like that um his friends basically narrowed it down to tragedies histories and comedies so even 400 years later um we we still relate to shakespeare's comedies because at the heart of them they're about lessons about life and reminding us to laugh at ourselves and to um, laugh at the ridiculousness of life and, you know, the, the genuine simplicity of it at the end of the day. Um, you know, some, some pieces might feel dated, um, obviously, but for the most part, you know, life is still the same. You know, the same things happen. They're just in different places, might be different names for them, you know. Um, but humor is a really, really important piece of, um, of Shakespeare's work. Even in his, you know, really dark dramas, he still has um, moments of, um, of humor to kind of lift you out of that, that dark tension and remind you to, to take a breath and to laugh because life is heavy, but there's always, you know, reasons to be grateful and reasons to smile. Um, Shakespeare's comedy was never just um, jokes or uh, stunts, but it was really his outlook on life about um, being optimistic and being hopeful. Some of his, tell his telltale kind of signs of comedy that he was known for, they would always take place in kind of natural green places set apart from the day-to-day -day world to kind of um, elevate the level of drama and take you away from um, the city and you know the, the high intense high intensity and the pressures of the day to day and and bring you to a simpler peace more peaceful place. Um, in Shakespeare's comedies, uh, you know, there's chaos, mistaken identities, disguises, 
um, all of these things that are kind of really intense, um, not necessarily realistic uh, until the end of the action when the, the confusion is settled or, you know, the, the person in disguise, their identity is revealed in kind of these awakening moments um, to depict a, a metamorphosis of, you know, to put it simply, life is crazy, all these things are happening, but at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's this simple. Another thing is uh, youth. So Shakespeare's comedies, um, and you know, I didn't actually notice this until I learned this, and then I started seeing it a lot more, which you might too, is that the comedies, his comedies usually revolve around younger people to kind of symbolize this, this new beginning. So older adults will, uh, characters will kind of set up the action and come again back at the end and, and tie everything together. But, but it's really, uh, most of the action is taking place with younger people learning lessons about life and finding themselves and things like that. Um, Fools and Clowns, which is a big part of his, um, of Shakespeare's writing too. There was usually, almost always, a character like this in, in his show. They were a big part of the levity that was needed um, in some shows. And also just to add, you know, mischief and humor um, and openly make fun of characters, you know, things like that. Uh, fools were more um were a little smarter they were they were kind of able to make fun of people to their face um in more deliberate humor so you think of like um the porter in macbeth who has this really big monologue just being a crazy drunk you know in charge of the keys um you know, Midsummer Night's Dreams, uh, Bottom, you know, who is just a really crazy, quirky character um, that the queen ends up falling in love with. Uh, you know, it's, um, there are these characters to really kind of remind you to laugh, even if, you know, say in Macbeth, there isn't a lot of reason to. Um, Shakespeare's clowns were more of the low class, you know, cheap, humor, um, physical thrills. Um, and they usually remained kind of outside of the action, so they would kind of give you a break from what was happening, whereas um, <clears throat> whereas fools were really a part of it and maybe even affecting how people made decisions and what they did. So uh, during his career, Shakespeare wrote or collaborated on, um, scholars agree, on about 38 plays. Uh, he also assisted with, they think about 150 sonnets um, or poems. So these are some of his early shows, um, you know, some of his most common, uh, The Taming of the Shrew, uh, Comedy of Errors. Uh, this was his, um, his kind of next phase of writing. You see Twelfth Night, you see Romeo and Juliet. Uh, the next phase of um, more, more everything, more drama, more comedy, more exaggerated um, works, you know, Macbeth, King Lear, Hamlet, Othello, you know, really uh, a lot of male um, royalty, a lot of, you know, tragic heroes, a lot of really intense drama. And then we've got kind of more uh, whimsical, a little lighter um, in his uh, final years of writing. So he retired um, in 1611. Um, he retired to uh, back to his hometown, Stratford-upon-Avon, um, where he lived out the rest of his uh, years, just a few years before he actually passed away, about five years. Um, so, the, you know, there's a lot that we can read into about his shows, um, about his plays, and about uh, the time and what was going on and, and you know, what speaks to what in his writing. Um, but they're also just really well-written, fun, 
really timeless pieces um, that I never get sick of reading or, or watching interpretations of them. So um, I hope this gave you a little um, insight into him and into his writing and, and kind of the times and hopefully excites you to look a little closer at some of his uh, really most popular shows and um, watch some, some reinterpreted versions of them. So this is series one of Shakespeare 101, and I hope I'll see you for the second part of Shakespeare 101, part two. Thanks so much for watching.